Tis the season for me to encourage you all to watch the World Junior Championships beginning today. Chris Peters, knower of all things prospects in hockey, joins us to break down the Minnesota Wild draft selections, Team USA odds, and much, much more. As always, we're created by New Voice Studios, presented by Soda Stick, brought to you by Talk North, Grain Belt, Jim Beam, and Royal Credit Union. This is Season 4, Episode 156. It's peanut butter jelly time. Soda Stick and the Minnesota Wild teamed up for another collaboration in honor of the duo that is Kirill Kaprizov and Matt Zuccarello. Get yours now exclusively at the Hockey Lodge. Plus, be sure to keep an eye out for some new Buttes merch at SodaStick.com. As always, you can snake 15% off all purchases when you use code BARDOMBEAUTIES at checkout. At Jim Beam, they know the importance of tradition. Like chanting, let's play hockey prior to the start of each game or playing the state of hockey anthem after a wild win. This season, raise one to your fan family with the bourbon that invites us all to come as friends and leave as family. Jim Beam Bourbon Whiskey, the official bourbon whiskey partner of the Minnesota Wild and XL Energy Center. Drink smart. Jim Beam Kentucky Straight Bourbon Whiskey. 40% alcohol by volume. Copyright 2021. James B. Beam Distilling Company, Incorporated, Claremont, Kentucky. Hello, everybody. What's up? We're back. Bart on Beauties, episode 155. I'm Jesse Pierce, writer for NHL.com, Wild.com. Basically, anybody that will take my byline, love to have it. My voice still gone. Kirsten over here, face of the Minnesota Wild. You'll catch her at home games, amongst many other things that she's always doing. What You were on another podcast today, Kirsten. I was. My good friend Alexis Downey, who is a content producer and host for Ducks Stream for the Anaheim Ducks, she invited me on today. So we were talking about, as we're recording this today, ahead of the Wild taking on the Ducks in Anaheim. So it was a fun chat. There you go. I love it. Speaking of the Ducks, we will talk World Junior Championships. You might wonder, how does that relate to the Ducks? Well, we talk Mighty Ducks. We talk about Connor Bedard, who is probably going to go to the Ducks because they suck. All of that good stuff. Chris Peter, Chris Peters, excuse me, from Flow Sports, as well as a good friend of mine joining us to break down the World Junior Championships. I love that tournament. Like, Kirsten, I have loved it since like 2010, which I'll admit, I probably didn't pay nearly enough attention, but it was after interning at USA Hockey and just really recognizing the importance of that tournament too, as it relates to the NHL. That's kind of when I've been like obsessed with it. Are you a fan of it? Do you tune in? Do you check it out? You know, I'm just being fully transparent. I will start off saying I do enjoy the world juniors tournament and I have enjoyed it more. The older that I've gotten, I never had NHL network growing up. Mm -hmm. So I really wasn't exposed to it as a kid. Um, But once I started going to college at St. Cloud and there were some guys on the Huskies playing world juniors. You followed along with it more. And now, especially this past year, after having worked in the junior hockey realm, I know a lot more names and faces. And anytime you can put a name to a face, actually watch them. And once you get to know them a little bit more too, it makes it all that much more fun to follow their journey as well. For the record, you don't need the NHL network. I didn't say that. I will let you know there are ways ways around it i like how you're looking around the room ways okay (laughs) i'll i'll hit you up for for the the deets okay let me know let me know because it is it's my favorite term again we will talk all about that in our second segment with chris peters breaking that down let's chat nhl yes we are recording this on a wednesday before the wild close out their kind of game a couple of games here before the christmas holiday break um because we're going to close things up for the christmas holiday break so we will not focus specifically on the wilds but i did want to talk about this year they have bye weeks in the nhl which was something that they had last year to kind of make up for the lack of olympic participation something that i didn't even realize until i was like why do the wild not play for a random week in january um i kind of dig it i think i kind of like it what are your thoughts, Kirsten, on the NHL implementing bye weeks into the schedule? Um, again, it's similar to how the NFL has always coordinated things, so maybe that's something to it. I really, really like it. I mean, even college hockey, they get bye weeks. I think they get two bye weeks a year. Um, but no, not only do I think media personnel can use the break, just having a little bit of time off 
Um, you're I talking about us. Much you're talking about like, us. Very much. I'm already mentally checked out. I'm physically <laughs> here, but mentally I've been gone for months now. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, but especially for those players, I mean, they want some time with their families, especially too. And that extra week as well, just to have to rest your body, especially this time of year when everyone's getting sick. I hope those guys aren't, but you never <laughs> No, um, it is just, it's, it's, I think a nice needed pause for everybody. And I think it comes at the right time around this time of year as well. Yeah, I agree. I'm, I, I'm sure the players appreciate, I'm sure the families appreciate, I mean, you get the all-star break as well. So you kind of do get the two by weeks unless you're participating, but maybe you see the participation in all-star uh, game go up a little bit too, because they'll have those other, that other bye week Um interested, excited to see how it works out. Speaking of bye weeks, and I'm going to try to segue this into the NFL because the Minnesota Vikings are playing on Christmas Eve because the Minnesota Vikings are this insane anomaly to me. They are not an 11 and three team, but they are an 11 and three team. Um, Who do you think goes further in the playoffs this year, the Minnesota Vikings or the Minnesota wild, the Minnesota wild have turned it on as of late after a very slow start. Um, What do you think, Kirsten? I know you're a big football girl, so let's hear your thoughts. I feel everyone's just going to hate me after this. Um, I say the wild will just because they're going to play more than one game in the playoffs. Do they get out of the first round? I'm hoping and praying they do sending all my thoughts and prayers that they do. Will they? I really don't know. Um, I feel, I I don't know. I'm going to be honest. I felt a certain way last year that they were going to get out of the first round and they didn't. We've talked about this so much. (laughs) Um, I am such a pessimist. I need to just see it to believe it. As far as the Vikings go, that biggest comeback in NFL history win where they came back back against Indianapolis, who is not good. What they have four wins under their belt this season. That was atrocious. I'm going to be honest. I'm not like a conspiracy theorist, but it seemed so fake to me just the way it was like. (laughs) not scripted, but the way it played out, it just seemed so fake. Like, is this legitimately happening? It seems too good to be true. They cannot, they absolutely cannot do that in the postseason. Sure. In the regular season, it makes a good story in the playoffs. You cannot do that. And we've seen it against Buffalo. That one was cool because Buffalo is a really good team. Then they do it against Indianapolis, who is not a good team. And I'm, I don't know. I was, (laughs) So many people were happy and prideful about that. I was like, guys, that should never have happened. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. It's like being down to Arizona after two periods and being like, oh, we'll play now in the third period, right? Like, it's just, it's, I, that was the same thing. I've said all year for the Vikings that it's not sustainable to play this way. And it's the same thing I said last year about the Minnesota Wild. When they were doing these comebacks in the third period, it was like, this is not sustainable. Somehow, both teams have made that a sustainable way to play. Now the wild not doing that as well this year. Again, they're just be deciding to play a full three periods as of late, which is very exciting. Uh, yeah. But like with the Vikings, I mean, there's something to be said about the belief in yourself, right? Like they go in and Hey, we're just down five touchdowns. No big deal. Like, okay. Like most mm-hmm. people say those things and don't believe that they can do it. And apparently yeah. can. So, but I agree with you, Kirsten, I'm sure the wild will go further because it's the Vikings. Like they are going yeah. to hurt us. Like they are. I going will to say us. though, Kevin O'Connell, I think he has people buying in because like you mentioned, we just need five touchdowns. The belief he has in his team. And I shared a video that I saw on Twitter yesterday where he's talking to the guys saying how much he loves them. And he's like in tears. I'm just like, this guy just seems so pure. How would you not want want to play for a guy like that especially no disrespect to Mike Zimmer but he was no Kevin O'Connell his the leaders on the Vikings buy-in because of who Kevin O'Connell is just his presence he's completely changed the culture in the not even full year he has been the head coach of the Vikings and I think that that alone is something for Vikings fans to be really excited about but we just need to see some playoff wins exactly you know it's funny because on my purple dailies before we die over on score north where you can find me talking vikings twice a week shameless, shameless plug, plug. <laughs> Jinx. um i had said the same thing about how this relates again to the minnesota wild which some person said puke he's done talking about the wild which okay i'm not um because it was the same thing that happened last year there was that culture change and that's why you saw the Minnesota Wild do as well as they did this year. 
same sort of situation. Now, last year, it wasn't a coaching change. It was just a general locker room change, right? A, a big change with the buyouts of Suter and Parisi. Um, and this, and for the Vikings, it's a coaching shift. But I mean, it is. It, it shows how true that is. And we had talked about last week in our episode that Ryan Reeves has kind of this presence. But we haven't really dove into like, you know, when Bill Guerin made that signing, we were all kind of scratching our head like, okay you know nobody hated it necessarily and Bill Guerin said it's because the person he is it's because the person he is he did the Santa thing last week which we loved but there must have been something to that because the wild have played better since Ryan Reeves joined this team and they already had such good personality and leadership in that room but Reeves just added something additional Kirsten what do you think that is or do you think it's just his general even on ice presence now they know they have somebody that they for sure have to answer to should they mess with Kirill Kaprizov or or what have you that opposition um you know what do you think it is about Ryan Reeves that maybe has turned the tide just a little bit more you know clicked a little bit more for the wild to find the success because I think you can't look at what they've been able to achieve without noting that Ryan Reeves addition had helped that Yeah, there's two thoughts that come to my head right away. I think other teams are scared to be (laughs) on the ice as the same time as Ryan Reeves. Oh my God, me? You? I'm scared just to be out on the ice because I am terrible at skating. I can barely stand up. Now imagine just facing off against a Ryan Reeves, and especially if he's got your number, I'd be terrified. I'd ask to like get off the ice. I would not want to play against him. So I think... That is a factor. And as of right now, I think I was looking at it this morning. Like he's like plus two or three as well when he's mm-hmm. on the ice. So, and he's played what, 12 games for the wild. So I don't, I think other teams genuinely, and I'm not even just saying this to be funny. I genuinely think other teams are scared or a little more hesitant when he is on the ice. Um, the other thought that came to my mind is I think At the time Ryan Reeves came in, we saw so many shakeups to the lineups. You saw Tyson Joe get put on waivers uh, Mason Shaw called up from Iowa and I think part of it when they brought in Ryan Reeves is I think there was a sense of your spot could be gone if you don't show up so I think that was a big part of it around the time does that affiliate with Ryan Reeves himself maybe maybe not um, but I think around that time is when things just came into place for the wild and I don't know if that was in the back of their minds as part of the mindset like we have to show up now yeah, I think the, those are two fantastic points. Absolutely. It's just there is there's something I can't even really put my finger on it. I mean, certainly, again, he is just this big body dude that nobody I mean, we saw it. I forget which game it was where it was like, nobody's fighting him. Nobody's going to take him on uh, when he had that. Oh, Detroit, when he had that clean open ice hit um, mm-hmm. against the Red Wings player. I mean, nobody was going to go And the fight he did him. have lasted maybe five seconds. Ben Shabbat tried, tried to say, hey, we don't like that, but I think he just drew the short straw because nobody was eager to jump into that. But yeah, there's just something about it. And I think, obviously, again, and we've said it time and time again, chicken before the egg, like winning makes the team better. You know, like all of it works together and you don't know which is first. Like, obviously, it's no fun losing. So I can't say necessarily that the culture is better because of Reeves, which caused them to win, or maybe the winning is causing them to have a better culture, yada, yada. But I think that it is interesting because Bill Guerin, again, and Bill, we trust. Like, I, mm-hmm. not that I thought it was a bad move. It was just a curious move to me. It For was, sure. It was very curious, but I'm glad. I will say working. Ryan Reeves from videos that the Wild have put out, just hanging out with the guys on road trips. He seems like a guy's guy. Like, yeah. if he is on your team, like, you will go to battle with him and he very much will go to battle for you. So I, I do think probably that team bonding, especially with him too. I, I don't know. He just seems to be a great fit in that locker room. Yeah, I agree. I love, love to see it. Um, kind of final thing on the locker room and in the spirit of the holidays, but maybe not, uh, <laughs> on my Christmas wish list, I had said a couple episodes back that I wished for a Matt Dumba trade and I'm not going to go back on that because you can't uh because I already told my husband I changed my idea on a Christmas present and he was very upset about that so I will not at all be changing any more Christmas present ideas uh it just sounds like it's Mike deals with so much he was so amazing like why would you send me something you didn't want I was like you said you weren't gonna buy it for me so I changed my mind so if you got it return it (laughs) Anyway, I don't want those sorrel boots anymore. Um, oh, but they're so cute. Uh, we'll see. We'll see. But uh, Matt Dumba sounds like 
it's not going to work. He will not return to the Minnesota wild next year. Bill Guerin telling Mike Russo uh, on his podcast that the odds of re-signing Matt Dumba just purely from a salary cap standpoint are very, very slim to none. Kirsten, do you think that a trade is in the mix or do you think they just let Dumba walk? What would be the perfect scenario? And again, this is just conversation fodder. Nothing's been reported officially. Uh, it was just Bill Guerin kind of speaking out loud. And it makes sense because it does. You're either going to have to move him. You're not going to resign him when you've got guys like Matt Boldy, who you also need to figure out how to extend and get him paid. And, you know, you're hoping for players to ultimately pull a Ryan Hartman and say, hey, I'll take a salary cut for some longevity here. Um, mm-hmm. But Matt Dumba, I believe his time with the Wild probably coming to an end sooner rather than later. My first initial thought is that very much surprises me. Like I'm kind of sitting here in shock right now, just only because I feel there have been so many opportunities to move Dumba and it just hasn't happened. So I think that's the only reason the shot comes into play. I would say if they could trade him earlier and some point this season and get something for him, that would be the ideal situation. But Mm -hmm. I just don't see teams biting on him to be quite honest. So I would say we're probably going to see him through the end of this season um, unless Billy G can work some sort of magic, which I mean, he's been known to do that in the past, but I just, I don't know what team would bite on him. Yeah, it'll be, it'll be curious again to see how things play out as we round the corner into the new year and uh, eye down that trade deadline uh, end of February as well. So that's going to do it for our first segment. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, Chris Peters. We're back. The only person I ever call when I need to know something about a prospect player or just in general, he knows everything about the future. Mr. Chris Peters. What's up, CP? Hey, Jesse. Um, Not much. Just the world juniors. So like nothing. I'm like, this is boring time for me. Yeah. You don't even like it, right? You don't even watch it. Don't even tune in. Nothing. No, I just try to avoid it at all costs. <laughs> Chris is the guru of all things, especially USA hockey. I mean, let's start there. How's Team USA looking? What are your thoughts uh, on them moving forward into this? He has obviously Jack Pert, Minnesota Wild prospect to uh, and a Minnesota native that we're going to want to keep an eye on here in the state of hockey. Yeah, a lot of a lot of gophers. You got you got Jack Pert. You got kind of a little bit of everything there. Um, and yeah, and some Minnesota natives. And boy, yeah, it's it's pretty crazy to see um, just the the representation of the different teams on uh, on this U.S. squad. And obviously, the Gophers have quite a few. But um, yeah, I mean, you know, as far as how they're looking so far, one pre tournament game down. They've got another one after we record this one. Um, and you know, they 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 won that first game. I thought they looked okay. I didn't think they looked great. Like uh, you know, they were fine. But um, you know, I, it's going to be an interesting tournament because there's a lot of questions going in. The U.S. has a really small blue line. Um, they've got you know, kind of a a goaltending group that's a little bit in flux. Caden Embarico is coming back uh, from from last year's team, and he plays at CC. And you know he's gonna if he, if if it's him or if it's Trey Augustine, the draft eligible goalie. Um, you know they're gonna have to make some saves. Uh, that's the U.S. is gonna need some saves in this tournament, and those guys have to prove they can make it. And so um, this is a big step up from every everywhere they played before. And so that's gonna be something that we're gonna have to basically wait and see. Um, up front, I think the U.S. is as good, you know, as, as, as most teams, uh, you know, Canada is going to be the favorite, but I think the U.S. has a lot of talent up front, a lot of first rounders, you know, Logan Cooley, Jimmy Snuggerud, um, Cutter Goche going to make up that top line, all first round draft picks, all, you know, in, in Goche and, and, and uh, Cooley, it's top five picks. And then, you know, Snuggerud is having a tremendous year uh, with the Gophers. So that's going to be a really good group. Um, you know, they'll, they'll have Chaz Lucius. It looks like as their number two center um, currently playing the AHL, the only pro player on their roster, whereas Canada has three guys that played in the NHL this season. Um, so <laughs> that'll be interesting as well. But, you know, in, in general, um, this is a tournament that where anything can happen. And, you know, I, I think you look at some of the teams, the best teams on paper don't always win. Um, you know, this U S team has some, interesting dynamics to it um i don't necessarily know if i would say yeah they're a favorite for gold uh but i would say that they're they're going to contend and they're going to compete and really the the u.s program now it's all about gold it, it there there really isn't uh anything less is, is a disappointment which is a, a great place to be because there was a 
when I started doing this, that was just like, Hey, maybe they'll, maybe they'll win or maybe they'll, <laughs> maybe they'll medal. So right. that's kind of, yeah. Like the, it's, it's, it's really shifted over the last several years where, you know, they have as many gold medals as Canada does in the last 15 years. So mm-hmm. it's uh, you know, pretty, pretty good, pretty good spot to be in for the U S. And Chris, you mentioned a lot of the players for team USA there. Is there anyone for you personally um, on paper from what you've seen, just following the prospects, anyone who you think is really going to make an impact or you think that particularly stands out? Yeah. You know, I think that USA's most important player is probably going to end up being Luke Hughes because he is, he's their biggest defenseman. He's going to play in all situations. They're going to play power play PK. Um, You know, he's probably going to get the most minutes at five on five and he's, you know, if, for a number four overall draft pick from New Jersey had a great freshman season at, uh, at, at university of Michigan. And so, you know, that is, uh, that that's really important. It's really important for him to, to play a lot and to be a meaningful player. Now he, he got hurt in the quarterfinal last year, last this summer at the last world juniors. And that almost tanked USA. Like it was, it was incredible how important he was to that team. He's even more important this year. Um, so that's a guy that I think is going to have to be key. And then, you know, of course, guys like Logan Cooley, Cutter Goche, Jimmy Snugger, who I already mentioned, but also guys down the lineup, you know, they need contributions from all over. It can't just be the big guns going. So, uh, but for me, as far as I'm concerned, you know, Luke Hughes, he's the captain of the team. He is going to be leading the team in ice time by far, I would think. And, and he's just going to play so much that it's impossible for him not to matter. So he has to stay healthy and, and be effective the baby of the Hughes. Is he in fact the best? Usually you find the youngest brother tends to kind of excel. And obviously Quinn and Jack, two very different players playing different positions, but where does Luke rank in the Hughes family? Yeah, man, it's tough to say. I mean, I certainly he had a bigger impact as a freshman than Quinn did, you know, and they're, they're the more similar Quinn's smaller than Luke is Luke six, two, his other brothers are under five ten. you know, so it's just, you know, they're, they're all jealous of his height, but I mean, as of right now, uh, you look at Jack Hughes and we're talking about maybe one of the best players in the NHL this season. Um, and so, you know, I, I think that Luke is is probably neck and neck with Quinn and and it's kind of a tie for second right now. I don't want to mm-hmm. put that, you know, because Quinn has had a really good NHL career um, and Luke still has to prove it at the next level. But what he's done, um, you know, I think we're seeing a, a, a player that's just scratching the surface of what he's capable of. And you know, the fact that all three are coming from the same family, boy, good thing they're, they have us passports, right? Cause that's, uh, <laughs> that, you know, we haven't had a family like that, uh, before, you know, you got the Kachucks and there are two of them and, you know, there've been a few brother duos and, and different families, the Granados, the suitors and different things like that. But, uh, there's nothing, there's never been anything like the Hughes brothers, uh, for, for the U S exactly. There's a good story written out there somewhere, I think with your byline on it about the, Hughes I heard story. that. Yeah. I've, I've heard there was uh some, something about them a few years back. Chris, I want to ask you. So this year's latest world junior championships obviously moved due to COVID after it was canceled middle of, or near the beginning, I suppose of the tournament there bumped to August. How does that affect things? How did that affect the shaping of some of these rosters? Did it impact anything? Canada, obviously winning gold over Finland there in overtime. What is kind of the transition now moving back to regular times, but having the world championship so recently in the rear view mirror? Yeah, you know, I think it, it it didn't necessarily, I don't think it'll impact this tournament so much, but it did impact the process of selecting the team. So like, just specific to the US, they had a summer camp that normally you'd just be trying to pick one team, they were trying to pick two teams out of that summer camp. So it left that that's why the US had a huge like, they, I think they had 32 total players come into their winter camp, which is way more than they would normally take in that situation. You don't want to have that many decisions to make at this, this late stage of the game. But I think that that summer camp, they didn't get the full feel for what this team was supposed to look like. So that is definitely a a factor in, in the decision-making process beyond that. I don't think it should have too much of an impact. I mean, obviously guys started their season earlier than they should have. I, I thought it was, you know, up until that gold medal game, that was the worst world juniors I've ever witnessed. Um, and it, it was, it was, it was awful hockey and it was, um, you know, just, it, 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 there wasn't great fan support until that gold medal game. So, uh, you know, I, I, I almost wish it didn't happen. Um, mm-hmm. I'm glad those players got the opportunity, but it was, it was not a good experience for, for anybody. I don't think. Um, and it also, you know, got these guys to, to have to really play high level hockey way earlier than they're supposed to. Um, I, I don't think it'll have guys this age. It shouldn't have that much of an impact on them, you know, in terms of, of, of quality of play 
USA has eight returnees. Canada has eight returnees. So, I mean, it's, it's a pretty, you know, they're, they're, they're Slovakia is going to have a bunch of returning players. It, it, there, if nothing else, there's just going to be a lot of players with a lot more experience than you would normally see. And it's switching gears a bit now from talking about team USA to now Canada, how do you think they're stacking up and what are you seeing from the roster they've put together? Yeah, I mean, it's a really good roster. There's no question that they're they're going to be the favorites going into the tournament. They're really solid top to bottom. Um, they have a huge decor, like, you know, only one guy below 6'2". So the polar opposite of USA. USA has one guy that's 6'2", <laughs> and everybody else is six foot or below. Um, and then Canada's got one guy that's 5'10", and everybody else is 6'2", or 6'3", 6'4", 6'5". So it's crazy. Uh, so that'll they'll be a heavy team. They'll be very difficult to play against. And then up front, you've got Connor Bedard, you've got Adam Fantilli, you've got Shane Wright, uh, you got Dylan Gunther, you've got all these players that have you know played NHL games or are going to be top picks in the upcoming draft. Um, it is a loaded group, so you know to say that they're 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 unbeatable is is not accurate because this is the World Juniors and they're they're young players and anything can happen at this stage. But it's going to be very difficult to beat that team. I think if there's one place where they're a little bit weaker, it's at the goaltending position. But you look across this tournament, and I, I, you know, I was having conversations with people. This might be the worst goaltending group we've ever <laughs> seen in a World Juniors. It's crazy. <laughs> but th- that being said, there are times when guys step up, and you like, I had no idea he had that in him, and and that can happen for any one of Canada's goalies, USA's. Any, you know, we've we've seen guys that you hear about at the World Juniors, and you never hear of them again, like Dennis Godla for uh, uh, Slovakia. I forget how many years ago that was. It might have been ten years ago when he knocked the U S out of the tournament. So, you know, there's a lot of uh, players that can step up and that's going to be the fascinating thing to watch. So, uh, but Canada un- unquestionably, um, you know, the, the best team on paper. And one other thinking- quick thing that I really yeah. want to follow up with you on quick that you mentioned, you mentioned Adam Fantilli. He's arguably an early favorite for the Hobie Baker this year, absolutely tearing it up at Michigan. How do you expect him to fare on the international stage? Well, you know, I think they're going to give him a great opportunity to to stand out. You know, Connor Bedard and Adam Fantilli are natural centers that are going to play the wing in this tournament. So that opens them up offensively. It allows them to potentially produce. Um, I think, you know, in, in Adam Fantilli's case, he plays with such speed and such power that, you know, that's something that Connor Bedard doesn't do. He's he's more of the finesse skill game. So you get kind of two separate factors, but two equally effective players in terms of how they generate offense and everything like that. So I think it's going to be fascinating to watch the dynamic. You know, we're all going to be watching those two players. How who's bet like who's who's better? But I think for Adam Fantilli, the way that he plays, if he just does what he's done for this entire season, he's going to put up put quite a few points in this tournament, and he's going to get at least people talking about, hey, maybe the gap isn't so far between these two players. Um, that said, I think Connor Bedard's going to probably score even more. Uh, so you know, you'll you'll have to wait and see. But um, I think that they're <laughs> Canada and definitely, you know, Fantilli and Bedard, they're going to have an impact on this tournament. And, and I'm, I'm excited to see how Adam fares because, you know, every step of the way, he has just been among the best players on his team, you know, wherever he's been. And this, this time he's going to have to fade into the background ever so slightly, but hopefully not too much for him because I think he can make a big impact. I just keep thinking about Bedard with like Trevor Zegras in Anaheim and the youthfulness there. Like what a team <laughs> that could create. Like my goodness. Sorry, Anaheim fans. I don't think you're going to come out of your hole that you've created thus far, but poor no, John Gibson. Stay in it. Stay in it. If stay in it. Yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. I, I am team tank for anybody that's <laughs> if you're out of the playoffs right now, just try to lose as much as possible. <laughs> I like it. I support that GM Chris Peters with that's the big right. move there. Yep. Um, I kind of a little bit more serious of a question for you. Chris, with all that's kind of transpired around Hockey Canada during this offseason and obviously, especially surrounding these U18 teams, these World Junior Championships and with Canada being the host, do you see that kind of playing in? Is there going to be extra eyes, especially on some of these young junior teams? What are your kind of thoughts there? We don't certainly have to dive too deep into it, but I mean, it's something certainly worth mentioning because it seems to be constantly in the news, even just recently. Yeah, you know, and it, it's important to, to keep it in the news. It's important to keep it relevant because this is a, a reckoning in hockey. It's something that we have to address as a community, but also Hockey Canada specifically has to address what happened in 2018. And so, you know, I, I think what you, the ways you will notice it, you're not going to see a lot of board ads here. Most mm-hmm. sponsors have pulled out of the World Junior Championship, and that has continued. 
Um, you know, I, I don't know this for sure, but like, I think hockey Canada had to like buy their gear, whereas you would normally get it from a sponsor. Sure. I don't have that confirmed. So I don't want to say that, like I'm reporting that, <laughs> yeah. but like, you know, like their, their equipment sponsors had pulled out as well. So like all of these different things have happened. So there have been real world consequences, obviously to what happened in terms of loss of sponsorship. I don't think it's going to affect the players themselves. I think that it mm-hmm. will hopefully, you know, I, the, the double IHF has like pre tournament meetings where they get all the participants together and they, they, they go over things. And last year, at the summer world juniors, they talked about, you know, sexual violence and, and, and also, you know, the, you know, just all of those different things that, that kind of come into play. And because that is something that, you know, these guys are young guys, maybe they don't understand as much as they should. I think now because of the way that that was in the news and, 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 and everything that's happened, it's really important that that conversation continues. Now, I don't think that these players that are playing, that they're representing Canada, and I don't think they're representing hockey Canada, they're representing their country. So, you know, right. they're, they're not going to pass up that opportunity. They're not going to boycott, you know, but it is something that, you know, they may, they might get asked about it. They might get, you know, there, there might be things, but really these players had nothing to do with that. Mm-hmm. And so um, it's, it's important to learn from what happened, but I guess, for them in terms of the actual, you know, hockey and everything else. I don't think that we'll, we'll notice that, but you know, TSN, which is, is covering the tournament in Canada. I fully expect them to continue to report on what's happening there. Rick Westhead has been one of the leading reporters on it. Um, so that will be part of their storytelling as the, as this tournament transpires, maybe people don't want to hear it too bad. We have to keep talking about it because it is that serious. And, and now there's, you know, there's been a report in the globe and mail about the fact that, you know, the London police appear like they're getting closer to having a uh, possibly laying some charges in this in this uh, mm-hmm. in this entire ordeal. So there's been, you know, the lawsuits and everything else that has happened. But this isn't over yet. And and we'll continue to you know cover it and talk about it. And, and we can't shy away from it. Right. And I mean, I have to imagine it is it's kind of there needs to be that change in culture. Not only do the conversations need to happen, but I think for so long, a lot of these players, and this extends beyond Hockey Canada, I imagine, are treated like kings and they get to do as they please. And I think that they forget that there are consequences to those things that they're doing. So action needs to be taken. So I do imagine that maybe the treatment around them is a little less, as you mentioned, if that is true, that they had to buy their own equipment. There's one example, for instance, <laughs> yeah. right? You're not just going to be gifted this nice stuff. There are consequences. And as you said, too, the, this team is not, you know, accountable for what has happened in the past. But it's one of those right. things I imagine you see that shift a little bit because I think that's such a large part of it is from the outside, the way that that culture has you know, allowed some of this behavior to continue. Yeah. And, you know, I just wanted to mention too, you, you kind of brought it up, you know, there, there is this sense of entitlement when, when you, when you're a junior hockey player, college hockey player, when you, 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 you are treated a certain way and you think everything is, is, you know, you're untouchable and that everything you can do pretty much whatever you want. And I think now the players are, are becoming increasingly aware that that's not actually true. And yeah, I think part of it is on the way that we treat them, the way that we talk about them and different things like that. But, you know, it's also on the people that are stakeholders and whatever teams they're with to to have these conversations and to make sure that they understand, hey, there is a there there, there are real world consequences for your actions and that you need to be accountable. And so I think that that's going to be a conversation that continues with our hockey players across leagues. And it better be happening in every single league, U.S., Canada, wherever you are, because it is such an important thing. Mm hmm. You know, Chris, back to the tournament itself. I love it. Granted, I drank the USA Hockey Kool-Aid as much as you (laughs) did, maybe a smidge less back in our interning days. Uh, But what could you tell folks that maybe tune World Junior Championships out, maybe don't pay as much attention? I mean, NHL goes on their Christmas holiday break, so you don't really have that as an excuse. Why would you encourage folks to really tune in and appreciate what the World Junior Championships offers? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's it's international hockey, which is always fun. I mean, I, I think I love international hockey more than I love anything else, um, you know, and just just seeing and it's not just because USA versus Canada, but it's you know, it's it is a chance to to play a, a very high level. It's it's one of the few best on best tournaments. And, and yeah, there might be a couple of players missing here and there that are in the NHL, but largely it's the best players under 20. It's a great preview for the NHL. If you are a fan of the NHL. And you are like, hey, where did Trevor Zegris come from? And you're like, oh, <laughs> he had this dominant tournament at the World Juniors. Or where did, you know, like some Matt of these Boldy. guys. You know, yeah, Matt Boldy. They're, they're all well known. 
now, but they started somewhere else. You know, Jason Robertson actually didn't have that great of a world junior. He had, he had some good moments at a world junior, you know, so you never know, but it's a chance to get familiar with the players that you're going to know in the, in the, in the world, uh, in the NHL, in the very near future. These guys are not far away. The top players, at the world juniors are typically a year maximum two away from making an impact at the NHL level. So if you're looking for a Calder race or the rookie of the year, that's there. This year in particular, if you are a fan of the NHL draft, if your team is terrible and you are like, hey, I, I am hoping that we get a great prospect, we've got three of the top four prospects in the in the upcoming draft playing in the tournament. you got Fantilli, Bedard, Leo Carlson for uh, uh, Sweden. Then you've got other guys that are still first-round pro- uh, prospects. Edward Schala for Czechia. Uh, Dalibor Dvorsky from Slovakia, Charlie Stramel for the U.S., Gavin Brindley for the U.S. You know, there's a lot of good players that are in this tournament that will be among the top picks in the draft. So you get to you a jump on that as well. So if you want to say, I saw these players before they were big, <laughs> the World Juniors is, is like the buffet that you could, you know, just know everything about these guys or think you do. Trust me, not everything's about the World Juniors, but it is an opportunity for you to kind of learn these players, get to know them better. And in the end, you know, you're, you're basically getting a preview of what's to come. And I mean, how could you not want to see Connor Bedard before he's in the NHL? How could you not want to see how Adam Fantilli is going to do while playing on the same team as him? You know, so there are all these different little things. And then, of course, there's the national element where if you're a fan of USA, you want USA to win. If you're Canadian, you probably want Canada to win, you know, so. Uh, or maybe you hate both teams and you want to see the Finns win or so. I don't know. Um, and, and up in Minnesota, whatever your of, cup and, of tea is. Yeah, whatever you can, and you can have one, two, three, four teams. I don't care. Root for whoever you want to. But it's a lot of fun. It's great hockey, and it's it's probably the fastest hockey outside of the NHL. So that mm-hmm. you know, it's basically to me, it goes World Juniors number two outside of the NHL in terms of quality of hockey. Chris, while we're on this subject, I promise this relates. This is the final question I really have for you. I got to know, how do you feel about Mighty Ducks 2? And are you <laughs> as averse to it as Jesse is? Averse? No. I don't I'm like it, Chris. Averse. Here's the reason I don't like it is because I know too much about USA Hockey. And I'm like, this is not a thing. The colors are off. It's nothing. It just yeah. it, the the authenticity of it drives me insane. Miss, missed opportunity not to get the branding in there. So whoever was working there at the time just completely missed the missed the mark. And then now we got the Hendrix hockey jerseys. I'll tell you why I love it. Um, because I was ten when it came out. <laughs> so so it, so it basically it basically was the it was my entire world and personality for basically age ten to thirteen. Um, so. When I was on the uh, on the blacktop next to the house, uh, I was I was uh, Adam Banks or whoever else, and you know <laughs> it's like so. Um, I love the movie. Uh, I I wish Iceland were better in real life because I would love to go to Reykjavik for a hockey tournament, um, mm-hmm. but unfortunately not. Uh, Trinidad and Tobago, let's go. Trinidad let's get you guys going. Keep it going. <laughs> um, even Italy was in there for some reason. So you know, like all sorts of great teams. I, I still want to know how they came up with Iceland as the bad guys, but I love it. Um, but yes, I am team D2 all the way. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I, we're team USA and we're going all the way. I mean, it's one of the great quotes of, of movie history. That's true. I uh, Jake Middleton actually had said that was his favorite as well. And he said it was because he wanted to play a team like Trinidad and Tobago, <laughs> although he did yeah. say he wanted to check the birth certificate of Gunnar Stahl in half of the Iceland team because he did not. Yeah, that Sanderson that. guy, I think, was at least 35 years old playing <laughs> in the junior Goodwill games. So, um, junior yeah. Goodwill game. yeah, yeah, just a beauty. And I mean, you, if your uh, affinity for Mighty Ducks paid off last year, right? With a nice Mighty Ducks jersey. You got that? Yeah, handy? I was. I'm. I, I'm reaching for it, but there is a laptop on top of it, and I will then shatter the laptop. So, but yes, I it is now prominent. It is a place of prominence in my house. I will always wear my Mighty Ducks District Five jersey. That one's a District Five jersey, and I very closely came to buying the special edition Adidas Mighty Ducks shoes that came out this year. I saw I those. Didn't, I didn't do it, and I think it's one of the great pieces of personal restraint that I've ever accomplished in my life. <laughs> I'm proud of you. I'm proud of you on all. Thank facets. you. I'm proud. There too. is there is a D5 beer that came out this year, labeled D5. With it's in Minnesota. It's only at like one location. I have a friend right. that's going to send me some. So if I get some, uh, I'm sending your way yeah, too. You absolutely. I, I will it. take all donations. Yes. Perf- anything, my Ducks. Chris, where can people follow you? Where can they find you? All the goods. 
Yeah. So, you know, I'm going to have, uh, I'll be at, uh, the world junior. So I'll, I'll be uh, on the ground and covering it for flow hockey. You can get that at flowhockey.tv. Uh, my podcast is talking hockey sense available wherever you get podcasts. And we also have a simulcast on flow hockey. Um, and then on Twitter at Chris M Peters, uh, wall to wall world juniors from now until, you know, January 7th, when I have my final tournament wrap up piece, It'll be nonstop World Juniors for me. I can't wait. Uh, really excited to do it. So I, I hope people check it out. Definitely go check it out. Chris is the best. And I'm not just saying that because he's here, <laughs> partially because he's here, but also because I believe it as well. I'll say behind your back too, Chris. You're the and best. also because we're Cyclones. Because we're Cyclones. Go State. That's right. Go. Go, State. go State. Chris, thanks for joining us. We're going to take another quick break. We'll be right back. Yeehaw. <laughs> hey, that's mine. That's I mine. Know, so I wanted you to say it back. Yeehaw. No, that like was... anytime I know I that's I was forcing that one. No, anytime somebody says something and I agree or I think it sounds good, instead of being like, okay, or sounds good, I go, yeehaw. Like that yes. is my my response. Like, okay, like I like it. Let's ride. That's right. Broncos country. Bronco let's country. Ride. Let's ride. Oof. Part on beauties. Well. Let's ride. Bar down beauties. Let's ride. Thanks again to Chris Peter for Peters for riding with the bar down beauties. Don't forget to follow him and all of his content over on flow sports. Seriously. He's the best. I have known Chris since I was a child at the age of 19 entering Iowa state university. And he said, here's a hockey TV show. Please don't screw it up. And I screwed it up probably a little bit, but I also made it better. So shout out to Chris. Love him. Uh, Last segment of this week's episode, Up for Debate. I kept the holiday theme, and we are just a day removed from Christmas if you choose to celebrate. Uh, so I wanted to know, Kirsten, what position or role would Santa Claus play in hockey? Would he be a coach? Would he be a goalie? Would he be a forward? I didn't give defense as an option, but obviously it's an option. What are your thoughts? I'm just going to say a goalie because I don't think Santa Claus, as much as we all love them, has the speed. Um, I think he's too nice to make anybody sit. So no healthy scratches. Um, and I feel like he'd literally just be like, I just want everyone to go out and have fun if he were a coach. So I feel like that doesn't work. He has to be a goalie. Plus the size, I think it would just make sense. The size, I think goalie makes the most sense. However, I kind of like the idea of coach only because I picture all the elves being the players. He'd have to coach a might team. Not NHL mites. Well, maybe they're all really speedy. Think about how fast they make toys. Can you imagine how fast those little guys could put the puck in the net? The biscuit in the basket or the cookie. But they'd have absolutely no defense. Sometimes the best defense is a powerful offense. Mm. (laughs) Hmm. I I'm listening, but I don't know. I don't know. I don't either. I don't know. At the end of the day, Santa does a fantastic job. We hope every single one of you had an incredibly great holiday uh, as well. Thank you for checking us out on your winter break. If you are on winter break, Um, thank you for subscribing, commenting, sharing all of that good stuff. You guys rock. You certainly make our holidays extra special. Uh, An extra shout out to our friends over at Fab Five for their generosity and their cards that they sent us. It was very, very, very sweet. We really, it's on my fridge. Guys. I want you guys to know that. Cause I know you're listening your front and center yes. on my fridge and you probably will be the whole year. Cause I don't take that stuff down. Mm-hmm. So fantastic. And again, everybody that checking us out, that is gift enough. So thank you very, very much. Don't forget our next live show, January 13th presented by green belt at Kazi's in Stillwater, another Stillwater show on a Friday night. That is up Jesse's alley. I'm sure the wild play the next day to ruin my fun, though. Let's get silly and stilly. Silly and oh my yeehaw. Yeehaw <laughs> is right. <laughs> I love it. So be sure to come check us out live on that day, working on some fun things for us to do there. Uh <laughs> there's a child in the room to say goodbye. Oh, oh, all I saw goodbye. was a hand. <laughs> uh not sponsored at all by ranch rice chips but i do recommend ranch rice chips as a snack for your children uh and yourself as well if you're looking to stay healthy this holiday season uh shout out speaking of sponsors shout out to soda stick soda stick.com 15 percent off when you use code bar down beauties shout out to green belt again that live show the 13th shout out to royal credit union less fee more free 
And shout out to Jim Beam. Cheers to you. Cheers to me. Official whiskey sponsor of your Minnesota Wild and Talk North. Thank you to you guys for featuring us on your kick butt network. That's it. That's a wrap. I'm glad I held it together for that one. Yeah, that's all. Same. Yeehaw. <laughs> Yeehaw. We'll see you guys next week. Bye.